Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out this evening. I'm so happy to see you. I'd like to thank Sarah. Thanks, Sarah, for inviting me um, to this absolutely stunning museum. It's like a gem here in northwestern Arkansas. Um, he can really design, can't he? Um, it's, it's spectacular. I've been texting pictures to my husband, who's an architect. Um, and I admit, it's pretty exciting to be standing up here in a building that he designed. I don't always speak in such glamorous settings. When I received an email from Sarah asking if someone from the Julius Shulman Institute would be interested in talking about architectural photography in general, and Pedro Guerrero specifically, I jumped at the chance. While photography that takes the built environment as its primary subject matter goes back as far as the medium of photography itself, so to the 19th century, it's been largely neglected as a distinctive field with its own disciplinary history. Your presence here tonight, however, suggests a growing interest in how photographs shape the way architecture is promoted, how it's analyzed, and how it's visited in our imaginations. I think Crystal Bridges is leading the way in this regard, and I hope more museums take their cue. So I'm going to start tonight by talking a little bit about the Shulman Institute and why we are interested in the history of this field. In the process, I'll tell something about Shulman himself and some of the photographers we've worked with. Um, for the second half of the talk, I'll focus on the career of Pedro Guerrero, likely known to most of you as Frank Lloyd Wright's main photographer, one of his main photographers. For most of us, a building is unknowable without a photograph. Despite our increasingly global lifestyles, our access to great architecture remains primarily mediated by visual representation. For most of architectural photography's history, however, historians allowed the vision of the photographer behind the camera to be largely obscured by the vision of the architect whose work was being captured. As Robert L. Wall stated in his book, Building with Light, this was in 2004, quote, architectural historians too often treat photographs as if they were the buildings themselves and not particular interpretations of them made at particular moments. Photographer Ezra Stoller, who's pictured here behind his camera, is one of the few to receive attention through monographs and exhibitions. It's rare, however, that those who write about architecture include the names of photographers, analyze their artistic approach, the labor that went to waiting for just the right time of day, the right light, and the particular angle, here, uh, that particular angle being from the side of an airplane nose cone, who would have known that would become such a canonical image, um, that would help us express the building as a reflection of an architectural vision or even an entire historical moment. A photo shoot often takes 12 hours from sunup to sundown. The photographer might return to the site several times, and then there's post-production, much of which is done digitally today. It is a laborious process, but from all the photographers I've talked to, an artistically rewarding one as well. The most successful architects know that a spectacular photograph can solidify a legacy in the popular imagination to a degree the building itself might never accomplish. It's a conversation. This is a picture of uh, Julius Shulman, very young, behind the camera with Richard Neutra standing right over his shoulder, probably trying to direct every single image. And then an image of Neutra sitting at his own home, the VDL house, which is in Silver Lake. It's actually just up the street from where I live in Los Angeles. Architects and design firms all have different approaches. But success is generally tied to cultivating a relationship with a single photographer so there's consistency between the imagery, as Richard Neutra did for Julius Schulman. A smart photographer similarly recognizes that an arresting aesthetic and strong publishing record attracts clients. Plus, it doesn't hurt if you can charm the architect, or at least match the size of their ego with your own, as Schulman undoubtedly did with Neutra. Still, the stories of photographers who have brought us images of architecture remain largely untold. I'd like to share a little bit about why I think this might be the case and how the Julius Schulman Institute is bringing awareness to the field. Some of you recognize these photos, maybe. I came to realize that photography of the built environment was an artistic field that was largely under-historicized through my interactions with Julius Shulman, or as some of us call him, Uncle Julius. Shulman himself, of course, is well known. His career is notable for documenting mid-century modernism through strictly controlled imagery that romanticizes the Southern California lifestyle. The photographer of choice for regional practitioners like Neutra 
and also William Kreisel, Buff Straub, and Hensman, and many, many others. He created a mythology glorifying the nuclear family of the post-war era. We see them housed under sleek, flat roofs and behind glass walls. You're likely familiar with this idealized vision. The photographer projects a graceful informality, while lush gardens meet steel frame buildings, and the adults are always lounging around. Cocktails and swimming pools, they're constant accessories. Believe me, this is how I live every day. <laughs> Shulman put self-promotion at a premium, but he did not give considerable attention to comprehending his work as part of a larger disciplinary trajectory. He was, however, interested in discussing how his photographic vision worked in concert with writers and architects to create awareness for Southern California modernism. This is important, I think, as a historian, because it suggests a photographer's recognition that their work can play a powerful role in shaping cultural history. So we may not think about them being involved in that historical role, but they themselves may at times comprehend that as part of their own project. When I first moved to Los Angeles, I went in search of the origins of that cultural history, specifically as it was expressed in the region's architecture. My focus was Esther McCoy. This is her um, in Shulman's garden, or in front of Shulman's garden. The photo is taken by him, and then on your right, um, the interior of the Eames house shot by Shulman. McCoy is the foremost architectural historian on LA modernism. Our understanding of Southern California mid-century architecture can largely be attributed to her prolific career that included articles for over a dozen publications, pioneering books like Five California Architects, and writings on the iconic Case Study House program. In her descriptions of buildings by avant-garde architects like Rudolf Schindler, Craig Elwood, and Charles and Ray Eames, she established what might also be considered a regional style, indoor-outdoor spaces, those large expanses of glass I talked about, open plans, and a casual engagement between garden and home. Architecture is tied to place, she argued, and LA's architects are fully engaged with their environment. Imagery was, of course, essential to promoting this perspective, and writers have known this from the very beginning. She found a partner in Julius Schulman, whom she recruited for many of her projects. It was a prophetic choice. His photographs didn't merely document her statements, but also used the medium to create a story about structures in a specific place at a particular moment in time. This is a bit of a grainy photo because there's uh, no other scan of it. Shulman took control of those shoots. If a house wasn't furnished as he wanted, he had the owner's stuff moved out and the furniture he approved of moved in. Um, he used to tell me he'd carry around this Eames chair in a truck and so he could place it just where he wanted for a shoot. Um, people always served as staged models, and if the landscaping wasn't grown in yet, well, he brought branches to hold in front of the lens. Uh, this is a citrus branch. You see one kind of staked up there and then one placed just right in front of his camera for this Cliff May House in Long Beach that was, had just been built. Interestingly, often the most constructed images were the ones disseminated through the popular press, such as this. Um, this one of Case Study House 22, which you probably recognize, and which became an icon representing a constructed identity for the entire city. This is a, a Shulman photographing the house. The, the models in the house were actually just women having a little uh, cocktail party, but he posed them just so and waited for the right time of day. It was by looking at Shulman's photographs and those articles and books by McCoy that I knew I needed to talk to the photographer himself if I was going to understand how modern architecture in LA, or really any architecture at all, developed as a historical construct. I didn't need much of an introduction. Until his death at age 99, Shulman was listed in the phone book. I just looked up his address, sent him a letter, and a few days later received a call. Hello, is this Emily Bills? This is Julius Shulman and I want to talk to you about Esther McCoy. It was like getting a call from the Picasso of architectural photography, but that's how Julius was, his door always open, his date book kept by himself. I made the pilgrimage to his Raphael Soriano design steel and glass home in the Hollywood Hills, where on many mornings we met over a sensible breakfast, he told me a sensible breakfast was very important to longevity, next to a wall entirely covered with family snapshots. We could see the garden through the living room slider. 
This was his pride and joy, the result of 40 years planting lush succulents in local wildflowers. One morning I looked up from our conversation and actually saw a bobcat walking past an aloe plant. This is in LA. One morning, um, Shulman was fully immersed in the California idea, um, immersed in California as an idea, as a lifestyle. But when I asked him questions about architectural photography as a discipline and the history of the field in Southern California, he didn't have much to offer. What was clear from those conversations was there is very little discussion between photographers in LA and the profession of architectural photography. As I dug deeper, I found Julius not only wasn't talking to other LA photographers like Marvin Rand or Wayne Tom, they also weren't talking to each other. This wasn't always true across the country, and things have changed a lot. Esto, the, films, uh, the firm started by Ezra Stoller in New York in 1966, or there's the firm Hedrick Blessing started in 1929, brought a handful of photographers together within a single agency, and a culture of mentorship started to develop. This is a wonderful photograph by Peter Aaron, who mentored with Ezra Stoller. Um, this photograph is done through a, a firm called Otto. So they now have firms that represent architectural photographers. Um, this is Rem Koolhaas's um, Villa de Ava in, outside of Paris. Organizations like the American Institute of Architects and the International Photography Awards have been honoring architectural photographers for decades. For most of the last century, however, there were no journals and few organizations dedicated specifically to supporting the discipline exchanging ideas and setting standards of practice. For many years, photographers didn't receive bylines in magazines or newspapers, and very few had opportunities to discuss their work as artistic exercises. When Julius passed away in 2009, he left the institute to Woodbury University, which is where I teach, to the School of Architecture there. And we saw his name as an opportunity to bring awareness to the art of architectural photography. We do this through a variety of public programs. So I thought I'd show you a little bit from some of that programming now. Um, this is our exhibition, Beyond the Assignment, Defining Photographs of Architecture and Design. It featured the work of 10 commercial photographers and put images you might only see in magazines on gallery walls. Part of the curatorial philosophy was to upset conventions, and bear with me here, upset conventions surrounding the cultural schism between photographs commissioned to promote a building and its creator, so you might call it commercial architectural photography, and photographs that might be considered quote unquote interpretive, or which challenge the viewer to consider the critical message the artist seeks to convey, i.e. art. So there's this idea that there's a schism between architectural, commercial architectural photography and art, and um, that's something at least while I'm director, I'm interested in sort of breaking down those boundaries a little bit. Um, making distinctions between these two categories is a tricky exercise, the exhibition suggests. One long hashed out in art historical literature over questions of artist subjectivity, debates surrounding high and low art, should there be such a thing, commercial influence, and cultural currency. While Shulman wasn't included in the show, his career holds within it examples of how commissioned work can move smoothly between the pages of trade magazines and the walls of art collections and museums. The majority of Schulman's career was spent producing mainly black and white work on commission. He, he would photograph anything from a detail in a building for a company that's trying to promote its materials to a full building for an architecture magazine to something for a trade magazine. And now he's in exhibitions alongside Walker Evans and Andreas Gursky, which is incredible. It's important to note, though, that his work didn't do this alone. It wasn't like a curator woke up one morning and said, oh, you know, Schulman should be in our exhibition alongside Andreas Gursky. There's a process that this goes through. Um, and sh as Schulman tells it, he didn't even think that his work was, you know, sort of museum worthy or exhibition worthy until a local gallerist, Craig Kroll, came up to him and said, um, I'd like to represent you, what do you think? Kroll ended up garnering for Schulman's work cultural cachet that extended far beyond the glossy magazine. It was advanced through Schulman's publishing partnership with Taschen. Bernard Taschen's put out a ton of books on Schulman um, and solidified when his archive, of course, was interred at the Getty Research Institute. So now if you want a Schulman photograph, Bob, you have to go through Getty <laughs> and it's not as easy as it used to be. 
Um, I suspect many more stories like this will transpire as archives of commercial architectural photographers are increasingly, quote unquote, discovered by the art world. So these archives have continued to pop up. I'm actually working um, on an archive of photographs by Marvin Rand, who was as prolific as Shulman in Los Angeles, and the archive is still in family hands and has not found a home yet. So it'll be interesting to see as more of these pop up, um, what interest the art world were taken, taken them. Uh, the Beyond the Simon exhibition strove to put con contemporary practitioners in this conversation. Interviews in the accompanying catalog reveal different artistic attitudes and technical approaches, but also reveal a history of mentorship that has much to tell us about the field's developmental history. This is a photograph by John Miller of the, does anybody know this building? Yeah, Farnsworth House in, um, just outside of Chicago by Mies van der Rohe. He worked very closely with one of Mises' assistants and uh, architecture students see his photographs all the time. I don't know if they always mention them and who took the photo in the classes, but they always use these, these pictures. Um, John Miller, who's now president of Hedrick Blessing, that firm that started back in the 1920s, worked for three years as an apprentice before being sent out on his own shoot. He remembers the day with humor. So the, I have the catalog for the exhibition is interviews with all of these different photographers, and you start to see this this history emerge of people, uh, photographers who worked with other photographers, and he talks about um, his first shoot with Bill Hendrick where he gets to go out on his own. So he says, Bill got an assignment to photograph the Chicago River. That area was very underdeveloped at the time. The assignment was to get out on Lakeshore Drive, which was a pretty dangerous spot, and look down to the river. Bill and I scouted the shots together, and he looked at me and he said, this one's for you. Sure, let me risk life and limb here. So that was the first one. I felt empowered and excited, and I knew it was going to work. By the time we're given an assignment, these guys are pretty sure that we're ready. We were also lucky to include work by uh, Timothy Hursley, uh, Sarah mentioned, who's no stranger to Crystal Bridges. I was pleased to hear that he spoke about his work here last summer, and he knows I'm here today. He was pleased to hear I was in Arkansas. Hersley apprenticed under Baltazar Korab. I don't know if you know him, but a new monograph on his work was just um, released, Korab, um, in Michigan. But he followed his brother south and opened an office in Little Rock, Arkansas, in 1980. His adopted southern home gave him an inn with Samuel Mockby, which led to his work for the Rural Studio in Alabama. If you're not familiar with the program, Mockby leads architecture studios with students in the rural south, um, building homes for the poor there with a focus on environmentally sustainable material. This particular house is built out of hay bales. Hursley returned every year to the sites, feeling a connection to Mockby's work that went beyond the standard architecture shoot. Um, and of course, you might also know him as one of Mosi Safdie's favorite arch uh, photographers. He photographed his uh, National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, and I've been curious to ask if he's photographed Crystal Bridges yet. Yes, thumbs up from the back there. Be, love to see those photos. At the heart of Julius Schulman's Institute's programming is an annual award that we present to a photographer of the built environment. So I thought I'd share um, two awardees that show how broadly we are interpreting the field at this particular point. Our inaugural award was presented to Iwan Bon. Um, it's a little overexposed here. I think it's the, the projection. Um, he's a photographer trained in art school, but he's very much entrenched in the commercial enterprise of architectural photography. He can often be found shooting architecture from a helicopter. This is an image of Michael Moulton's inner city arts building in downtown Los Angeles, sort of like a white oasis in a gray city. Yet Bond's also sensitive to the lived experience of those on the ground. This is a photograph of Le Corbusier's Palace of the Assembly Building in Chandigarh, India. And you can see how he reveres the architect's experiments in concrete geometric forms. At the same time, however, he also tells a story about modernism's programmatic transformation as the buildings age and people adapt them um, to their uses. The building was designed to, con to conduct legislative business, but it's also a place to take shelter from the heat and wash when no other sources are available. It shows Bond's skill at humanizing the everyday lives of people in extraordinary circumstances. In 2013, we honored someone very different, Catherine Opie. 
Uh, Kathy's intimate portraits of friends in the sadomasochistic community brought her acclaim. Surprisingly, however, it was a 1994 series of very small photographs of LA's monumental freeway infrastructure that surprised the art world. So this, not such a surprise, but this kind of rocked the world of art. They didn't expect her to photograph freeways. Abstract and melancholy, they are rendered precious objects, bringing beauty to the mundane. And when I say small, they're about this big, and they're absolutely lovely. Um, there's a big trend in architectural photography now to shoot and print as big as possible, and she, she counters that. I also love her eye for personal detail and depictions of how people occupy, decorate, and alter the spaces they inhabit. A series of house facades characterized by overwrought gates and intimidating doors reveal both the decorative proclivities of wealthy inhabitants in LA and also an insular and defensive attitude towards the street. In some ways, and after looking at these photographs for hours and hours, I really think they're as much portraits of people as people themselves. The best part of directing the Julius Schulman Institute is getting to know the artists themselves and creating a platform for them to tell their stories. I was lucky to work closely with Pedro E. Guerrero when I co-curated co what would be his last exhibition in 2012, Pedro E. Guerrero, Photographs of Modern Life. Guerrero was Frank Lloyd Wright's main photographer from 1939 to 1959. And as you know, and it's already been talked about tonight, Crystal Bridges recently moved Wright's wonderful Bachman Wilson house to Bentonville to ensure its continued conservation. So, I thought it seemed fitting to spend the second half of my talk discussing Guerrero's career, including his time as Wright's photographer. I think it's also an opportunity to give a little more in-depth look at one photographer's approach. Um, so I'm going to continue with him tonight. That's him in the, the top, by the way. Let's see. Guerrero was born in 1917 in a small house in Casa Grande, Arizona. His father actually built that house. Um, it still exists, surprisingly. It was a time when there weren't many options for a young Latino in a small southwestern town. Segregation was everywhere in evidence. He attended a Mexican-American only elementary school. And after graduating high school, there were few professional options for him outside of manual labor. His father was a sign painter, and he wasn't interested in going into that. But I do think there is something about the artistic aspects of painting that had entered the family's consciousness. Um, after graduating, um, I'm sorry, he decided to follow his older brother to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. But once he was there, he was told all of the art classes were already filled and he'd have to settle for photography. He reluctantly enrolled, only to find he felt an instant connection to the medium. Still, he was an artist at heart, and Art Center's commercial focus failed to engage his more abstract interests. I was a bad student, he readily admitted. Instead of completing my class assignments, I'd wander along the beach photographing dogs and dead pelicans. Still, there were inspired teachers, including one who took them to Malibu to reckon with the lack of contrast produced by brilliant West Coast light on sand dunes. This was the 1930s, a time when Malibu was largely unpopulated, where a few lone houses graced the hills, and there was a palpable bohemian spirit. You can see this free spirit in Guerrero's early masterful response to the white-on-white -white environment in his photo of the intertwined curves of a painted tree trunk, scarf, and female body. These early photos show a remarkable care in capturing how harsh noontime light and form interact, something that would later show up in his pictures of desert buildings. After two years, however, Guerrero still wasn't interested in the school's curriculum, and he returned home to Arizona unsure of his future. Luckily, his dad, who was tired of seeing him mope around the house with his camera, had been following the career of a local architect who had, studied, who had started a school in the area. He told Guerrero to ask him for a job. The architect happened to be Frank Lloyd Wright, the school Taliesin West. Wright had set up his home and studio about 24 miles from where Guerrero grew up. There wasn't much out there at the time, just desert cactus and a few telephone lines. Pedro didn't know much about Wright, but he didn't have anything to lose. He wrote to Wright, and then he drove out to Taliesin, and as luck would have it, Wright needed a local photographer, and he hired Pedro on the spot. This was in 1939, and Guerrero was only 22 years old. 
The early exchanges between Guerrero and Wright hold within them some of the great stories of the relationship between architect and photographer. We learn much about the personalities of both and the way in which they negotiated their separate artistic visions. It's not always an easy negotiation. Architects are notoriously controlling. My apologies if there are any architects in the audience. I'm married to one. Um, every material, every corner condition, every piece of furniture inside is a reflection of their conceptual project and ultimately their professional portfolio. It is both a personal expression to be judged by your colleagues and also an advertisement to attract potential clients. And very rarely will those assessing the work see it in physical reality, but rather in a picture. To hand over control of that imagery requires great trust and faith in an outside eye. Wright gave it to Guerrero, and a long partnership ensued. So I'd like to show a video clip of Guerrero in 2012 talking about his relationship with Wright and his interaction with him at that first meeting. The talk is from, um, the talk is with art critic Hunter Drohoyoska Philp at the opening to our exhibition um, to a full house. Take note that Pedro is 94 years old here and he died just a few months after the exhibition's opening. It was a true honor for us to have that exhibition before he passed away because it covered much more of his career than had typically been exhibited. Um, we see here, him here full of life and his special wit. Um, one other note before we start the video, uh, it's a little bit visually subpar. You can see the audience heads in the foreground. This was a freshman film project and the professor was new and didn't know how much they needed to oversee the production. So you'll see some, a couple weird zooms and some heads, um, but you can hear Pedro and that's the most important thing. Um, okay. That was almost the beginning of deciding that there was time that I left the Art Center School. But the Art Center School uh, gave me a very bad crit, and they were right. I, they, uh, uh, Tim Cadam said to me, you came here with the idea of being taught and you defy us to teach you. And that's true. So I went home and I was uh, moping around and Dad said, uh, Dad got tired to see me uh, working with my camera and not knowing what to do. And he said, why don't, he had, he had followed the career of Frank Lloyd Wright. And he said to me, why don't you go up on the hill up there and meet that fellow Wright. Maybe he needs a photographer. And, uh, but I might add, the hill up there is 24 miles away from Mesa, Arizona. About 24 miles away, but there was nothing in between. Yeah. Now there's <laughs> got there. <laughs> so you drive through the desert and you uh, drive through the And I got there and, and Mr. Wright was, uh, I'd never seen him like that before. I didn't know really who he was. I knew he was an architect, but I didn't know much about architects or architecture. But he was standing there, I never saw him that way again. He was wearing khaki shorts, white uh, athletic socks, and open-toed sandals, a polo shirt, but he carried this marvelous cane and was, was waving to guests who were leaving at that fantastic pork pie hat. So he looked at me and he said, who are you? <laughs> and I said, my name is Pedro Guerrero, and I'm a photographer. And you and I have corresponded. You said, come any time, and here I am. So uh, he said, well, come on in and show me what, you, what you've done. So I had the world's worst portfolio, as I said. You know, little girl and a dog, uh, a dead pelican with a, <laughs> with a beer can in the middle, and a uh, of that, and dudes, of course. He often uh, looked up at me and smirked, or smiled, or was taken aback. And when I showed him the dudes, he said, oh, I see you have a fondness for the ladies. <laughs> and I said, they're school scientists, Mr. Wright, what do you expect me to do? You know, so. Anyway, uh, he said, uh, what are you doing now? And I said, uh, uh, oh, I'm looking for work. Now, by the way, I, when I introduced myself as Pedro Guerrero photographer, I had never made a nickel out of photography, I had never shot a, a job, and I had never introduced myself as Pedro Guerrero photographer. But he gave me a job. After we'd been together for 15 minutes, he said, photograph anything that you want here. Everything here is important. So he, he said something like, 
Uh, you can start now if you want. And I said, no, I don't have a camera. He said, I have a camera that takes good pictures. <laughs> and uh, I said, no, I better, I'd better, i rather have mine. And uh, anyway, I'd like to go home and start early in the morning. And uh, I remembered that he said what he said about uh, he had a camera that took good pictures. And uh, I didn't like it at all. It was one that he had used himself that had uh, a lens, but it didn't have a shutter. So I had to use the cap uh, on the thing. And when, when he was doing it in, in, in Venice or where he was, it was easy for him to take the cap off the camera and say 1001, 1002 or something. But by the time I got the camera, I couldn't very well make the difference between 125th and 115th, so I gave up my camera. Uh, I, I ran into him one time, and somebody had asked him, Mr. Wright, what pencil do you use? And he said, oh, my dear man, it's not the pencil, it's the man. So a few uh, uh, days later, he came upon me taking pictures, and I was taking everything. Which, by the way, I had never done architecture before, but I decided it was sculpture, and I... Uh, uh, photographed it for that. But he saw me working with uh, my camera and he said, I told you that I had a camera that took good pictures. And I said, Mr. Wright, it isn't the camera, it's the man. <laughs> and he, he never questioned it again. <laughs> he was very, he was a lot of fun. He Tell was some fun. things that you learned from Frank Lloyd Wright because you, you really talk about how he was sort of a mentor to you and he helped you see to architecture in a certain way. What are some of the specific things? Well, I, I think I think what he did first was allowed me to go out and photograph whenever I moved me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had a little time getting used to the architecture because I didn't know anything about it. And here he was building a fantastic building. Yeah, this is Taliesin West. Taliesin West in Scottsdale. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, out of desert sand and stone and cement and forms and so on. The only thing he ever said to me was, that I want you to take a photo of my building and I want to recognize it as mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we, I, I've shrunk about three inches. But at that time we were about three inches apart. Now I'm about six inches or so. Anyway, uh, he, the only thing he told me was, I don't want bird's eye views. I don't want... Uh, uh, Warm side views. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I designed sitting down or at the most standing up. And I, that's the way I wanted. I don't, and, uh, but I, uh, he just let me go and I photographed for maybe a week or two and I could not work at Taliesin because he didn't have a lab. I went home every night and I worked on my own lab. And I came back in a couple of weeks to show him what I had done already. And he was very pleased. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was only one time that, oh, he, first of all, I told him that as he could see by my samples, I knew nothing about architecture. But he said, well, I'll teach you. So, but, he actually didn't, except once I brought something into him and uh, he didn't like it at all. And he said, I don't ever want to see this again. He was 72 years old at the time and I figured, he's so damned old, he's not going to remember it, so I brought it back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, I thought I told you I didn't want to see this again. <laughs> So he said, tomorrow you bring the negative and the prints and a pair of scissors and we're going to destroy this. <laughs> and my, my greatest regret is that I didn't keep a copy of what he turned out. You know, I just destroyed it, mm -hmm. which is what he wanted me to do. But we had a great time. He was a playful, wonderful, generous <laughs> man. <laughs> it a great sense of humor. Um, it's always hard to follow Pedro. Um, so, young and new to the profession, Grow fit right into Wright's studio culture, and by that I mean he didn't ask to get paid. And while he didn't take Wright's offer to room and board at Taliesin, his photographs of structures and the fellows in residence 
show an acute understanding of Taliesin ideology. While Wright was new to Arizona, Guerrero had an intuitive understanding of the desert light. Pedro foregrounds the cruel sun, the severe shadows, and opportunities made by the architecture for a respite. Oh, sorry, that was Pedro before our, um, at our exhibition in LA. This is that photograph. I think these little openings are filled in by glass or something now at Taliesin. Yeah, unfortunately. Wright, I don't think, actually liked this photo. Um, he didn't like uh, the sections. He wanted more full building photos. But I think it's a wonderful photograph. In his photos of the David Wright house, of which he was only allowed by Wright to take two pictures, because Wright was mad at his son. Um, this is his son's house. He bravely tackled the light at high noon, projecting an acute sense of the heat's intensity as it baked his southwestern assignments. For the Pawson House, he foregrounds Wright's sensitivity to the natural landscape. Rubble wall merges seamlessly with the rocky sand and shrub of the desert terrain. I'm particularly taken by a series of photographs of fellows hanging off of Taliesin West in a state of half dress as they attend to the day's construction tasks. The photographs are entirely about young, muscular bodies, sweat and sun. The architecture is merely backdrop to Pedro's real subject, the physicality of life working for right. In photos like this, you can see how Guerrero was both complicit in the mythology right rove, that's hard to say, right wove around his career, while also acting as interpreter. The story changed based on location. His images of Taliesin East from 1940 counter those of the West, where sweaty muscular bodies are exchanged for a life of repose in the tall Wisconsin grass. Wright is pictured surrounded by students like they're his disciples or children. It's an unscripted moment, but also a pictorial reinforcement of Wright's ethos that there should be no boundaries between an architect's engagement with nature and professional practice. After serving in World War II, Guerrero moved to New York, where thanks to a portfolio filled with Wright's buildings, he started getting magazine jobs. As his family grew, however, he decided to move to New Canaan, Connecticut, where he began renovating a house in his spare time. He loved renovating houses, so he didn't take pictures in his spare time. He was always tinkering. His family has lots and lots of funny stories of him building things and tearing things down. Um, in New Canaan, he was removed from the artistic community of New York, but he continued to get commercial work for journals like House and Garden, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and Architectural Record, for which he documented hundreds of buildings by modernists from Aero Saarinen to Joseph Salerno. The locations weren't always inspired. Guerrero did his best with this zebra and flower motif. <laughs> and even the most innovative architects created interiors no photographer could salvage. I call this Philip Johnson's unfortunate mauve phase <laughs> on your right. Other shoots reflect the bizarre experiments of the day, although I think this is a fantastic photo. For this article, House and Garden attempted to remake the garage into living space. So they set dressed it as a child's birthday party, which seems a little unsafe to me. Um, but like I said, I think it's a great photo. But then there would be a day shooting Aero Saarinen's IBM Watson Research Center that resulted in spectacular madmen moments like this one. I never had a chance to ask Pedro if he was aware that New Canaan was such a modernist hotbed when he moved up there, or if it was just a happy coincidence. Regardless, he found himself neighbors with a community of architects called the Harvard Five, so-called because most of them worked, um, most of them um, either taught or were educated at Harvard, um, but most of them were in New Canaan because they were then involved with Yale School of Architecture. The group included architects like John M. Johansson, Marcel Breuer, Landis Gores, Elliot Noyes, and Philip Johnson. This is his photograph of Johnson's house. They were, lived not far from each other. This photograph is actually from 1984. It's a later photograph that he took. Um, this was a particularly rich period of his practice, producing, producing fantastic work um, for, let's see, fantastic work like this of Alan Gelbin's Luthold House in New Canaan. This is from 1962. And this house actually has a really intriguing elongated plan, and there are some clear Wrightian influences onto Gelbin's work. But let's be frank, this photo is all about 
those, uh, those trees in that pond, right? Guerrero became a coveted photographer in the area and received offers by architects to work with them directly, including one by Marcel Breuer. This is Breuer's house, again, that long grass. An opportunity that I believe would have resulted in another seminal architect photographer relationship. Guerrero turned him down. Ever loyal to Wright, he only photographed buildings when assigned through magazines so that he would be on call whenever Mr. Wright picked up the phone and called him. Luckily, there were lots of important magazine jobs. Before our exhibition, the photographs from these shoots hadn't been exhibited. In some ways, the breadth of Guerrero's creative portfolio was overshadowed by his work for Wright and the strong community that continues to preserve Wright's legacy. Guerrero himself was often surprised with our choices, including this image of the Diamond Service Station by Thomas Little in Macon, Georgia from 1961. And this photo actually became the opening photograph for our exhibition. So it went from uh, Pedro saying, why do you want this photograph, to us putting it at the very front. I think it's just an incredible document of Guerrero's eye for the folding dynamic forms of the period. The sweeping bend in the station's roof line is mirrored in the car's fins. And if you look closely, um, you can see a little girl peeking out the back window. The station is a reminder that there is a great variety of modern architecture in the United States, and that our less known examples, tucked away in small towns or manifested in humble typologies, could be some of our most evocative. Guerrero approached architecture as though it was sculpture, like he said, capturing the three-dimensional qualities of the compositions, visit, visible and twisted roof line of this Royalton church by Joseph Salerno, which I think is just fantastic. Um, I'll show you a image of the interior of the roof. There's a whole series of these that are really breathtaking. Um, or you could see also an Aero Saarinen's hockey rink in New Canaan. Since many of Guerrero's shoots were for lifestyle magazines, my co-curator Anthony Fontenot and I also discovered portraits of designers in their homes, including this 1948 shot of Marcel Breuer and his wife reclining on their deck. This is in 1948 for Harper's Bazaar. Guerrero was a marvelous portraitist. He understood the architecture, I think, because he understood the architect. Able to show the personality of designers in space, he was always respectful, but also humorous, as you could probably understand from listening to him, and insightful. For example, his photographs of Edward Durrell Stone's vibrant, almost ornamental New York townhouse renovation shocked the modernist community when the photos were first published in 1957 in Vogue. Jarrell Stone, um, as many of you probably knew, know, grew up nearby in Fayetteville and went on to become an enormous personality in the architecture world. This photo is taken um, after he just won the commission for the American Embassy in New Delhi, a project that distanced him even further from the international style and its supporters. The townhouse was a bold early experiment in postmodernism's historicizing. Pedro, I think, recognizes the classicism. He shoots him in one point perspective, but he also engages the ego. It's a complex picture. Durrell Stone is dressed formally for the photo, and he poses in typical architect fashion, you know, big man behind his desk with his blueprints pulled out in front of him. Um, but for me, it almost seems like a lonely image, the architect in the distance, swallowed by patterns and objects and weighed down by that chandelier at the top. I am taken by these portraits of artists in their physical surroundings, how the space becomes a reflection of their approach to practice. Guerrero found great opportunities for informal moments, such as this one of Wright, deep in conversation over a drawing. His close relationships with artists like Alexander Calder and Louise Nevelson, with whom he had long relationships. So after Wright passed away, he worked with Calder for a couple decades and then went on to work with Louise Nevelson as their main photographers. And I think his photographs of their work reflect an important, important understanding of the blurred line between their sculpture and their homes in which they were created. Um, so he looks at it from the vantage point of someone who thinks about architecture and not just the art. And I, I really think that an architectural photographer can be best suited to that kind of job. His seminal book on Calder, um, which you haven't seen, is a great purchase. Um, and it's, it, he suggests that the physical space in which Calder worked was as important as the sculptures themselves. This is uh, a photograph that was taken one summer 
and Pedro perched himself above Calder's like huge cavernous studio that you can see here, waiting for just the right moment to shoot him at work. I don't know how long he was perched up there, but it, it wasn't a short period of time. The result, though, is this breathtaking wide shot of the artist, just one figure among an abundance of materials on their way to becoming sculptures. Conversely, a close-up of Calder's desk is utterly subsumed by papers and materials for half-finished projects. And I think it's as much as a portrait of the artist as that of Calder himself. At our exhibition opening, Guerrero talked to a standing room only crowd, holding the audience in rapt attention as he recounted stories that made us feel like we too knew these architects whose work filled our history books. He had a special way of poking fun at Wright's grandiosity while remaining respectful, Oops. which had the audience roaring. In these stories, he was always, as he described it, sh the short, fat, but cute sidekick to the great master. <laughs> you had a sense that Wright let his guard down around Pedro. It is visible in the photographs that show Wright at ease, walking down a path or taking a break during an installation of his work at the Guggenheim. Guerrero was the last person to photograph Wright before he died. It's a touching portrait of a large personality only slightly reduced by age, posed at his desk, retirement never a consideration. If you'll indulge me for one other video clip from our exhibition opening, I'd like to let Pedro tell the story of that final encounter. That was, I didn't have anybody else. So uh, that was uh, always in demand. Huh? And in fact, you're the last photographer to take a picture of, of Frank yeah. Miller before he passes away. Well, yes. Uh, uh, when he was working on the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, he was living at the Plaza Hotel, and uh, uh, he uh, he wanted me to photograph what he had done. With him. He changed everything. He wanted, to, he wanted you to go back and tell us and photograph yeah. it all over and again. And he wanted me to come later. back and photograph tell us it again. And this was 1958, December. So in February of 59, I went at his bidding to photograph tell us and he and I walked around the periphery of the of us and West uh, and showed me what had happened in my absence. And, uh, you know, and uh, wanted me to take over uh, and, and do the, the new stuff that he had done. Uh, by that time, Mr. Wright, and I didn't realize this until after the photos were printed, that he was beginning to show his age. For, for once, he was using the cane because he had to, not because they had a flare. And... Uh, so uh, uh, I finally did the, the whole thing, the whole taliesin again, and I went and asked him if he would pose one more time. But I didn't say one more time. As it turned out, it was one more time. But I asked him if I could photograph him again, and, and he, he obliged. And uh, when I got to doing that photograph, uh, which turned out to be the last one, that was ever taken of him. And uh, I went over to tell him that I was true. Was there anything he wanted me to do it? And this would give you an idea what our relationship was like. He said, I want you to get a helicopter and fly all over the place and photograph Talies and, and some of the other buildings. And uh, uh, so I said, I, so I ordered a helicopter. The helicopter came and uh, I went in to see Mr. Wright, and I said, Mr. Wright, the helicopter's here. What would you like to have me do? And he said, well, you don't. Oh, he said, you know what to do. I don't have to tell you. And I said, Mr. Wright, why don't you come with me? You could, well, you could see it from up there, and you can tell me exactly what you want me to do. And he said, no, one of us has to stay down here. <laughs> yeah, no. So I said, uh, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> the helicopter comes down, we go both get killed. The paper tomorrow is going to say Pedro E. Guerrero and Fred died top. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Get out of here, get out of here. <laughs> and I never saw him again. <laughs> 
So I'm going to end here, but I'd just like to conclude by saying I think it's a great time for the museum to be collecting Wright's Bachman Wilson House. So unfortunately, Guerrero um, never photographed this wonderful exercise in wood and glass. Um, the photo here is by Tarantino Studio, but we can imagine what those images might have looked like by considering his interpretations of the Robert Wright House um, on the right and the Pawson House on the left. And I know if he was alive, he'd be intrigued to hear about the house's future and likely have an amusing story to tell about its architect. Um, but this is a great time because Guerrero actually has been selected to be an American master by PBS. And his nephew, Raymond, is, uh, has worked on a, a documentary about him that I think will be just lovely, just lovely. And I hope you'll be able to catch it. I wasn't able to show clips from that today because you know, they have rights on it until it's released. But I do have the trailer to the film that I wanted to show you as sort of an ending here. I think it's, it'll be aired in September. The minute I developed my first roll of film and made my first print, I thought, this is mine, this is for me. It was a magic that I could control. And I still feel that way. Guerrero had a real natural gift. I mean, how else could a 22-year-old start taking perhaps the most telling photographs that have ever been done of Wright's architecture? First job I had after I left school after two years was with the world's greatest architect. Pedro's photographs taught me who Frank Lloyd Wright was. He ran a photo lab in a small town called Cerignola, Italy, where they trained gunners to be cameramen. Pete was most certainly part of the what's now imagined as the glamorous madman world of 1950s and 1960s. I worked for Vogue, I worked for Harper's Bazaar, I worked for Good Housekeeping, uh, almost every magazine that existed at the time. And it was, you know, it was glorious without much effort. My re recollections of Pedro was that he was more like Alder. He liked to enjoy himself, he liked to dance, he liked to be playful. It was chaos, it was a good word for it, but there was a, a uniformity to the chaos. He could see something and know how to photograph it. I walked into a world that was black on black on black. He got in there and got it somehow. I mean, that's the mystery of an artist. I photographed Frank Lloyd Wright three weeks before he died, and, and Alexander called it two days before he died, and then eventually I photographed uh, Louise Devilson a few uh, weeks before she died. So I decided I'm going to quit photographing artists. I mean, they're going to say, here comes Pedro Guerrero, for God's sake, go hide. So I hope you get a chance to see the documentary, and thank you again for having me today.